Good morning. Good morning. A very warm welcome to you today, especially if you're a visitor or you're one of those that will be joining us later via YouTube. Welcome to you all. Um, have you all been enjoying the extended Jubilee break? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Partying? <laughs> Street parties and things. Okay. Um, I know if you're if you're retired. Um, bank holidays don't have the same significance um, or importance, but for those of us still working, having a four-day break, break is really good. <laughs> um, so I'm Ian, one of the members here, and we'll be hearing from uh, Wes in a little, little bit later, our minister, um, and he has, I think, a Jubilee-themed survey service for us. Is that right? Loosely, okay. Uh, first of all, a couple of notices. Um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be joining together in the hall after the service, um, and that's for like, refreshments and hopefully some biscuits and cake and things. Uh, so please do stay for chat. Um, it's just a great opportunity for us to get to one and know one another and to uh, just spend some time together. So, so do come through for that. We have junior church this morning, so there's no craft materials out for you, um, but uh, you'll be going outside a little bit later and doing all sorts of uh, fun activities in the hall. And towards the end of the service today, we'll be joining together uh, with the simple meal of communion, which you're very, very welcome to, to join with us. Um, one other notice, we have uh, the, glow, the glow room will be up open after the service for the young people to go to, um, assuming we get one more volunteer uh, to, help, uh, to help Cameron. Her camera's so, yeah, just willy A's, but that, that'd be great. Um, okay, so as a family here together, it's always really good to celebrate together. So were there any birthdays this week? Is there a birthday? <laughs> Zoe? Oh, we can sing. Zoe's birthday. Can we sing happy birthday to you, Zoe? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Can I offer you a chocolate? That's a bit more tempting. You don't have to come up here if you don't want to. I'll come down to you and you'll, I'll, I'll offer you a chocolate. And let's, uh, let's see happy birthday to Zoe. And I'm going to stay away from the microphone. <laughs> Let's just pray for Zoe. Heavenly Father, thank you for Zoe. Thank you for that you are a God that loves us and cares about us. And we pray that you will continue to look after and bless Zoe over this coming year. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's start our time of worship together uh, this morning with, with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning to praise and worship you. As we worship this morning, let us remember that whatever is happening in the world or in our lives, we can put our trust in you. Thank you that while we worship here in Devices, we stand together with millions of others around the globe that know that your son, Jesus Christ, died and rose again, paying the price for our forgiveness. Lord God, we pray that, you, that we will know your presence and your forgiveness here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's, uh, let's stand and sing our first song this morning, Lord, I come before your throne of peace. So please stand and sing.
Before the uh, young people leave us for junior church, let's, uh, let's pray for them. Lord God, thank you for the young people here this morning and for all those young people that aren't with us this morning but have links with this church. Lord, we pray that you will give them the strength and a desire to know you in a world where it can be increasingly difficult to acknowledge you as Lord and Saviour. Thank you that they are part of our family and fellowship here at Sheep Street and we pray that you will bless each one of them and those involved in teaching them as you guide them and strengthen them this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. As the, uh, as the young people leave us for junior church, let's, let's stand together and sing, My Jesus, My Saviour. Um, just before we pray, just giving you the heads up, there will be an opportunity for a, a time of open prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world in, in the middle. I will indicate when that is, and then obviously then I'll draw that section to a close. Let's pray. Holy Lord God, thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence. Thank you that we can talk to an all-powerful majestic creator God, marvelling that you care about us individually and that you want to have a real living relationship with each one of us. Thank you that that is, that is possible through the sacrifice of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
Thank you that through prayer we can talk to you, knowing that you're listening to us. But as we draw closer to you now, please remind us that we need to listen to you, as well as talking to you. We ask that you still our thoughts and minds, and ask that you lead us through the, bless us through the leading of your Holy Spirit at this time of prayer. As today's Pentecost, it's appropriate to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit on each one of us Amen. who've made a commitment to follow you and invite your Son Jesus into our lives. Amen. We thank you for that first Pentecost and the impact on the disciples, the power of the Holy Spirit that gave them to preach fearlessly your word to those in Jerusalem and from there throughout the world and throughout the centuries. And we rejoice that that same Holy Spirit is here with each one of us more than 2,000 years later in Devizes, as well as with our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world. At this time, we stop and think of those who follow you, who have to meet in very different circumstances and situations to those of us who are free to do so here. And we're going to pause for a moment and pray for our worldwide church family especially for those who meet in fear of their safety. Lord, we pray for Christians in Ukraine, for Christians in Russia. For those in China, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Tunisia, <coughs> Lebanon, and the many, many other countries around the world where they either face conflict or where persecution for following you. Thank you that incredibly, despite that, your Holy Spirit is growing in those churches still and providing protection for those there. We thank you so much for all our brothers and sisters that we've prayed for in our hearts and out loud. We thank you that they've been visited and blessed by the same Holy Spirit who was present at Pentecost. The same Holy Spirit is here with us now helping us discern your will for us, your church, among your people and devisers. And we pray for uh, the other churches and devisers that you'll richly, uh, richly bless our outreach into the community and that we will continue to work together to share the good news of Jesus in this town. Lord, we thank you for our church family here at Sheep Street. Thank you and praise you for everybody who's here. And for all those who are not, wherever they are, that you trust that you're watching over them and with them this day. We think of those we know who are not well. We pray for those who are struggling financially and mentally. We pray that we will watch over each other and that this will always be a fellowship where people feel able to share concerns or doubts that they have openly and honestly with each other. Thank you for the meal and the quiz and the fun for Jubilee that took place here on Friday. For those who came, for the friendships made and renewed. We pray for the work of Renew Wellbeing, Girls Brigade, Junior Church, Lunch at One and the new youth group outreach. Lord, we thank you so much for the leadership team, for those who've served faithfully for so long, and for the encouragement and blessing of Gemma and Luke joining the leadership team to share some of the workload 
but also to help to share the good news with more people. Finally, Lord, at the end of this jubilee celebration of the Queen's 70 years as monarch, we pray for all the royal family. We thank you for the Queen's life of service to this country, for her dedication to her country and her compassion towards people. We thank you for her strong Christian faith and the way she has used her position to share that with people. We pray that she's been able to enjoy this busy period and as she reflects on the last 70 years, that she'll know that you've been with her through the good times and the bad times Amen. and that you will continue to be with her in the future, whatever that may hold. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in our hearts through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that you, the eternal King, are with us in everything we do. Amen. You're here with us now. You'll be with us when we go home, to work, to school, and whatever the coming week brings. And we praise you for the amazing truth that you're the king of creation and you love us, each one of us, your created children, that you love us just as we are. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cameron. Let's stand together and sing. Uh, what will we sing? Ah, oh, beautiful Lord, wonderful Saviour. Fantastic. <laughs> Oh
Our, um, our reading today is taken from John 13, 2 to 17, uh, which if, you, if it's easier for you to find on the Pew Bibles um, with the page number, that's 1081 in our Pew Bibles. Oh, and, and it's on the screen as well, so even better. Okay. I'll crack on then. Um, the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let's pray for Wes as he brings God's word to us this morning. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for Wes as he brings your word to us this morning. We pray that you will open up our hearts and minds and help us to concentrate on what you are saying personally to us this morning and how we might practically live our lives glorifying you. Bless Wes with the right words that will bring us understanding and insight into the joy of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning, Wes. Yay. We always know Andy's here. It's good to have you, Andy. Um, do I sound all right? Am I not too echoey? I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, I want to share a story with you to start off with. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but let's just run that it is. And it's about somebody who had a Model T Ford car, which was like one of the first kind of mass-produced cars. And he buys it, and it breaks down very quickly. And he's kind of, he's put the boot up, and he's kind of pretending he knows what he's doing. We've all done that before, trying to work out what's gone wrong. When suddenly, this very flash car comes out and it stops and this man comes out dressed in the nines and he says to this other person can I try and mend your car please and the other man thinks this is ridiculous this man's never done a hard day's work in his life but anyway he allows it and the man takes off his jacket he rolls up his kind of linen or silk or whatever's a posh shirt does that and within about 20 seconds the car is running again and the man's obviously very, you know, very grateful, thanks him. It's only quite a few days later when the other man realises who the person was who mends his car. As he's looking at the newspaper and he sees a photograph of Henry Ford who had designed the car. And don't we love stories like that? We love stories of people, leaders, serving others. 
especially when they don't need to. Now, have a look at these, uh, this motley crew of four people here. Uh, this is from YouGov approval questionnaire. Okay, it is two, <laughs> so yeah. And you'll notice it's, it's apolitical, because I've gone through up the whole lot here. And um, this is the approval rating of these people um, on the 26th of May, which is when I did the sermon. So about, about two weeks ago. Here you go. Here comes the first one. Boris Johnson. The number of people who think he's doing a good job was 26%. It has dropped since then, but we'll go with 26%. And then we've got the lead of the opposition, okay? He's on a staggering 30%. And then we've got Nicholas Sturgeon, 27%. <laughs> so between them, they're between 26 and 30% of the population, the voting population, think they're doing a good, good, um, a good job. And then we've got the Queen, okay? 70 years in, and she is on, you ready for it? 75% approval rating, which is absolutely astonishing because we're quite a miserable bunch in this country and we like saying no to people. Uh, no one else in the royal family comes even close to 75%. Do you want, do you want me to share Prince Andrew with you or shall we just leave it? At, no, lots of shakes of the heads. We won't tell you his approval rating. It's low. Um, but when people are asked why the Queen's rating is so high, virtually every time one of the top two or three reasons is... Hang on, I want to quote, she is best shows servant leadership, seeing her work as service. And people don't say it quite in those terms, but you get the idea. That's what people say. Something about servant leadership, which we love. We absolutely love. I want to quote what she said 70 years ago, almost to the day. She said, I declare before all of you that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. And she's done that for 70 years. We love servant leadership. And in today's passage, what we have is Jesus' perfect example of service. And I only want to really focus on one verse, and it's verse 15. And verse 15 says, I have set, this is Jesus speaking, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And he's saying that to the disciples, and if we're followers of Jesus, he's saying that to us. I'll read it again. I have set you an example, but you should do as I have done for you. Now the disciples are kind of gathered for this Passover meal, and um, somebody needs to wash the feet, and nobody offers. It is the lowest job at the time. The servant slave would do it. And I'm going to say something a bit grim, so you might want to close your ears a second. It wasn't just sand on the feet. Virtually every commentary I said, was, um, said, there'd have been excrement on the feet. It's not a pleasant thought. Not just animal, human as well. It was a grim job to do. And all I can imagine, I was trying to think of some, some, think something just to show us what it was like, would be the Queen coming to Sheep Street today. There's a thought. And she arrives, and next minute, she's putting the marigolds on, and she's cleaning out the toilet. Or she's sorting out our sewers, which are now sorted out. So, and we wouldn't even be close with that about what Jesus does here. And we think, no, that's wrong. The Queen wouldn't do that. We give her the, a place of honour, etc. That's not even close to what Jesus does here. Just think of it. Jesus Christ, God's Son, who is God. Everything created through him. The light of the world, the only way to the Father, the Messiah, God is with us, the Alpha and Omega, and he's washing poo off Peter's feet at the end of the day. This is Peter, the loudmouth, violent Peter, who will soon lie about Jesus. And Jesus wraps a towel around him, and that's what he does. It is, the more you think about it, the more incredible it is. And he knows, you might notice in the passage, he goes around and says everyone's feet of the disciples. It doesn't, it doesn't say he starts with Peter, it's just that Peter has a moan about it. He goes around each person, including Judas, who's about to betray him. And Peter cannot get his head around this. He just can't get around, his head around this. And the reason he can't get his head around it is because Peter is saying, if I was leader, I wouldn't be doing this. That's why Peter can't get it. He's saying, why are you doing this? You're the teacher, you're the leader. Why are you doing the service of this? And I think there's two main reasons Jesus does this. 
And the first one is not as important as the second. So first one I'm going to say really quickly. The first is, it needs doing. And nobody did it. Nobody offered to do it. So Jesus picks it up, I'm going to do this. But the main reason he does that is in verse 15. He does it as an example for you and me. If we are followers of Jesus, Jesus is saying, now you've seen the example, this is what you need to do. A list of service. So this is what I'm going to do in the sermon. I'm going to, do, I'm going to mix it around a little bit today. I'm going to do, first of all, the pitfalls of service. Where we go wonky-donky, where we mess up on. And then second of all, what Christ-centred service looks like. And thirdly, how on earth do we do it? So we're going to start the pitfalls, where we go wrong. Then what it actually looks like. And then third, but most important is, how on earth do we do this? Because we're not built that way at all, if we're honest. Now, the first three pitfalls, the first one is really, really obvious, but I've seen people make a mistake on this. Okay? The first one is, Jesus' example isn't so much about washing feet. It's about service. I've been, I'm, I've been in a church before, but once a year, they had this big sort of exercise of washing people's feet. I hate people touching my feet. I loathe that. But anyway, they had this big exercise, and it felt like a tick box. We've done service to each other. I did not want anyone to wash my feet, okay? I can, I can assure you that. It felt like a tick box. That is not what this is about. Now, on Thursdays, we have, we have something called Renew, which Pam set up for people with mental health issues. It's an amazing thing, it really is. And we have this elderly woman there called Margaret. And each week, she washes people's feet and massages them. She's never gone near mine because I couldn't, I couldn't cope with it. But she's not doing it as a tick box. Because you've only got to speak to Margaret to realise, and she's an elderly lady now, that she has lived a life of service. It's just one expression of her service. But the first one, which is really obvious, is this isn't so much about washing feet, this is about service. Now the second one, I bet more of us have fallen into. You cannot do everything. You might remember the sad story of Olive Cook, might ring a bell in a minute. She was a 92-year-old found dead at the bottom of Avon Gorge. Um, I guess it was a couple of years ago now. Possibly suicide. She was exhausted by requests from different charities, some of you remember now. And the charities would come in asking, and she kept giving and giving and giving and getting more and more stressed as her health declined. Saying yes to something means saying no to something else. The most helpful thing I ever heard someone say was a rectangle, which is your time, and it always stays the same. And you have circles in there, you have service in there, you have looking after yourself, you have worship in there. And when you make a circle bigger, the rectangle stays the same size. Another circle goes smaller. And don't we think we can squeeze more and more in? You can't. You have the same amount of time. When you say yes to something, you say no to something else. And sometimes you have to say no to stuff, and it's really difficult. And sometimes you have to say no to stuff that's really good. And sometimes I have to say no to stuff, and I hate doing it. But sometimes you have to, because burnout helps nobody. We look towards Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, had time to relax, time to go quietly with his Father. He had time to go to parties, if you read about it. He made time for that. We don't need more time. It's that sometimes we just need to simplify. I love this quote from Paul Borthwick. He says, To live a simple lifestyle means to live intentionally beneath your potential standard of living for the purpose of sharing your excess with others. We need to be wise with how we give. We can't take on more and more stuff and make ourselves ill. That is not God's way. We need to be discerning about our time and our resources and our money. That's the second pitfall. Here comes the third one. I'll be honest, this is the one I fall into. I am terrible for number three. Number three is true service tips into self-righteous service. Okay? And a great person to write about this is a guy called Richard Foster. People call it now virtue signalling. It's when you say something online about how great you are just to make yourself look great. Virtual signalling. It's basically you're trying to look good. Service is done not because there's a need, 
but, um, and we're called to meet it. Service is done so that I look great to as many people as I possibly can. And it's really good for us to check our motives. And a good question to ask is, are you and I serving people and nobody else knows about it? There's a wonderful person in this congregation. I'm not going to look, I'm not sure she's here or not, so I was going to scan across. There's this wonderful woman in this congregation who I found out recently the service she does for somebody else and she doesn't tell anybody. And it was a complete coincidence that I found out about her. That is true service. There was no song and dance, there was no virtual signalling, it was just quiet, faithful service. And her reward will be in heaven. Self-righteous service, Richard Foster says, needs compliments. Often dressed in religious language, because we love doing that, don't we? But self-righteous service wants something back. And if it doesn't get it, we're bitter. Self-righteous service is affected by our moods and whims. And therefore, it is temporary. It goes up and down. There's a great story by John Max- Maxwell, which I think is true, about... Um, There was a grandpa visiting his grandchildren, and every afternoon he fell asleep, absolutely, really fell asleep, dead to the world. And what they thought would be funny to do would be to get some um, Limburger cheese, it's that stuff that you can smell from a mile off. And they put a little bit, it's not funny at all, they put a little bit just on his nostril, but a teeny, teeny amount. And of course he wakes up and he goes, oh my goodness, this room stinks. And he goes into the kitchen, this room reeks, it's horrific. And then apparently he went outside and went, what is going on? The world smells, etc. That's what a self-righteous person can be like. They go around and they can spot mistakes a mile off, pointing a finger, etc. And they forget that maybe the stink is on them sometimes. Because this is the most damning one of them all. Self-righteous service fractures communities. It fractures the church community because it centres on the individual and it puts people in your debt. And if we're honest about it, it's manipulation. And it points to service. It's a real tough one. We've got to be careful. And we are human, and I can fall into this trap very easily of virtual signalling. Let's look at what service actually looks like. Okay, I'm using Richard Foster again on this. The first one is, it's humble, and it's often hidden. It's humble, and it's often hidden. I love this quote by Richard Foster. He says, the flesh whines against service. We don't want to do it, we're human. Okay? The flesh whines against service, but it screams against hidden service. Have you ever done something for somebody, and you are dying to broadcast it to people, but you know you should... I'm glad some of you are smiling, it's not just me. It's, I'm dying to say it. I'll, I'll shoehorn it into a conversation sometimes. And then think after, oh, you were just virtual signalling, and that was ridiculous. We find it so difficult to put ourselves out, but to do it hidden and nobody know about it, and even the person you've done it before doesn't, doesn't show any gratitude for it, is so difficult. It is so difficult. That's what we're called to do, guys. And it is tricky. And second of all, it's sacrificial. I see this daft prayer that, God, help me to enjoy doing service, etc. And, and, and God can do that, but it will be self-sacrifice. You won't be skipping through the trees like the sound of the sound of music at the beginning, I don't know where that came from. You won't be doing that all the time. It will hurt to to do it. It will cost you time. And don't we in Britain love time? That's the one we do. I I, I can give money a lot easier than time. But it will cost us time. It will cost us money. It will cost us effort. And it will also cost us pride. Because we'll do stuff which we think is beneath us. It is tough. It's really tough. Don't be surprised when you're sacrificing with someone and you think, I'm hating this. I'm smiling, but it's really difficult. Don't be surprised by that. It's not sacrifice if you're... It's not a sacrifice for me to sit and watch a Netflix series, okay? I'm enjoying it. Like, oh, it's a sacrifice. But sometimes it's a real push. Don't be surprised by that. And third of all, it is faithful. It keeps going. Who before has had initial enthusiasm when you start stuff and then you start conking out after a bit? This person I was talking about a minute ago who does this this amazing thing. She has done it for years. And I had to extract it like a tooth. You know all about that. I I had to extract it from her saying, how long have you done this for? And it was years. And she was keeping it quiet. It's faithful. It keeps going. And it serves where the need is not where our want is. 
we can sometimes go, oh, I'd love to get involved in that. And that's good. I think that's really good. But sometimes you go, there's a need here. I don't want to do it. But no one else is. I, bet, I better pick that one up. And it's therefore a matter of the heart. So instead of choosing how to serve, we choose to be a servant. It's not a list of good things. I've done that before, and I tick them off, oh, I've done all these good things. But it's not that. It's about a life of following Jesus. It's picking up a cross each day and following him. And it is tough. It is really tough sometimes. But it can be done. Because Jesus calls us. Jesus is never going to ask us to do something we can't do. So the important bit at the end is, how do we do this? I want, it's quite a long quote. I want to quote Dallas Willard. You can't really go wrong with Dallas Willard, in my opinion. Here's what he says. He says, we can become like Christ by doing one thing. By following him in the overall style of the life he chose for himself. If we put our faith in Christ, we must believe that he knew how to live. We can, through faith and grace, become like Christ by practicing the types of activities he engaged in. It's the last bit I want to focus on. By practicing the types of activities he engaged in. So what did Jesus do? Uchi Anazir says this. He makes it really simple. This is what he says. He says, these are things Jesus did. He prayed. He practiced solitude. He studied and meditated on the Bible. And he regularly served others. That's it. They're the main things Jesus did. If you go through the gospel, you will hit most of those most of the time. He prayed. He practiced solitude. He studied and meditated the Bible. And he regularly served others. Don't we make Christianity really complicated sometimes? There you go. Five things he did. And we follow in Jesus' example. And we ask the Holy Spirit to help us, who lives within us. We can't do it in our own strength. And it doesn't mean it'll be easy. And come back to that again. It's really difficult. So we pray, especially for two things to pray for. Pray for compassion, that you see people how Jesus does. Not the problem, but the person who's made in the image of God. We pray for compassion and we pray for patience. If you're not a particularly patient person, I am not a particularly patient person. I have to pray for patience. Don't pray long term, just pray, God, give me enough compassion and patience till the end of the day. Help me get to the end of the day without saying something I'm going to regret. And when I put my head on the pillow, the next day, give me the next day. Do a day at a time. You pick up your cross daily, not pick it up for 50 years and on you go. Each day, say, give me enough compassion and patience for today. And then, going on from that, Uchi Anazir says a simple little, little thing you do. He says, set your mind on what Jesus did, practice those things, and bingo, you've got a life of service. It is that simple. It's difficult, but it is simple. And my question to throw out as I come to the end is, what do you set your mind on? What do you set your mind on and what do you fill your life up with? Right at the end, there's a promise. Jesus is so, Jesus does this time and time again in the, in, in the Gospels. He sets down this really tough thing for us to do. He tells us how to do it. And then, because he's so gracious with us, there's a little bonus at the end. And this is like time after time after time in the Bible. Here's what he says. He says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. There's a promise there. We can skip past that bit and just read it really quickly if we're not careful. Now you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. That's a promise. Sometimes you might feel, you might be sitting and thinking, do you know what? My life following Jesus feels a bit stale at the moment. We all go through those seasons. You might feel God feels far away. You might feel you've been treading water for years. You might feel apathetic towards the things you know you shouldn't feel apathy towards. May I suggest it might be about you not serving as much? Maybe. Not definitely. Because I know in my life, without a doubt, the closest I feel to God, when I feel God's presence close, and like the hairs in the back, and you just know God's presence there, nine times out of ten is when I'm serving. Nine times out of ten, it's when I've stepped out and said, done something, I don't really want to do it. And God's there. The blessing is there. You see, when you serve, you will be blessed. That doesn't mean you'll love every minute of it. It doesn't mean you'll become financially loaded or something crazy like that. It certainly does not mean that. It means you grow as a person to be closer to who Jesus is. You get blessed. 
the person might never thank you for what they did. They might be a pain in their neck in what they do. <laughs> Who knows? But you do it self-sacrificially, you do it with love, you ask for compassion, and you will become moulded a bit more like Jesus, just like the song we just sang a minute ago. You will take a little step, and that's what a Christian faith is, it's doing little steps of saying yes to Jesus. And you look back and you see how Jesus has transformed you. You will be blessed. Aren't we blessed to have a queen who's shown us for 70 years, whether you are a royalist or a monarchist, or they're both the same, <laughs> what's the Republican, whatever, wherever you stand on that, aren't we blessed to have a queen who for 70 years has shown service and is so overt about her faith? A good example for us all. 70 years she's done it for. This is what she said in 2012. We remember that God sent his only son to, be, to serve, not to be served. And this role model stretched out his hands in love. What a quote by the Queen. This role model stretched out his hands in love. You see, having taken a towel and washed filthy feet, he later stretched his hand out on a cross. For you and for me, the ultimate sacrifice. That is self-sacrifice. So you and I, all the junk we do, he takes there. And we just turn to him and say, yes, please, Jesus. I want to follow you. What would that look like if we all did it? What would it look like? I'm going to finish ever so briefly, just, just a quote from Peter Grieg. If every single Christian today, all two billion of us, were to spend tomorrow saying an unconditional yes to Jesus, I believe we'd re we would rewrite the headlines for the world. Generations of bitterness could begin to be broken as long-awaited apologies finally were offered. There'd be an outbreak of reconciliation between warring spouses, neighbourhoods, even churches. Amazon profits would dive as two billion Christians stop shopping for things they don't really need. Worship music would unexpectedly surge to the top of the streaming charts. By the law of averages, billions would turn to Christ if two billion of us simply obeyed our Lord's command in sharing the good news of Jesus. Suddenly, vast amounts of money would inexplicably be given to the poor. It'd be the greatest redistribution of wealth the world has ever seen. In a 24-hour period, the markets would go crazy. You know, you're not responsible for two billion people, nor am I, but you are responsible yourself. But it's a scary thought that one day each one of us is going to have to give an account of our lives to Jesus. It's a scary thought, but what a time to actually start doing that now. Because what the world needs is people who follow Jesus to act like they follow Jesus and actually obey his commands. And he says to us, I've given you an example. Now do it and you'll be blessed. May we as a community, may we individually be a people who serve others in the strength of the spirit we can't do ourselves. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And Jesus, thank you that you came here on earth, not to be served, but to serve. And you show us so clearly in this passage, there is no excuse for us not to serve others. May we do that, Lord, when it's really tough. May we do that when we're not um, when we don't get the thank yous when we're looking for stuff, Lord, may we just do it because you call us to. And I pray for each one of us here, Lord, give us discerning not to take on too much, but show us what you want us to do, Lord, how you want us to further your kingdom. And may we do all of this, Jesus, for your glory. We thank you, Lord, that you show a perfect servant leadership. May we do that ourselves, Lord. Amen. 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 Let's sing uh, our next song, and then we're going to go for communion. Uh, take my life.